I'm Cahill Summers. And I'm Georgia Glenn. We are Chagas Sustainability Advisors. And you're welcome to the Chagas Environment Edge podcast number 50, bringing you the latest information, science and opinion to improve farm sustainability. We'd just like to thank all of our listeners for your continued support over the last two years. We really appreciate your continued listening. To celebrate our 50th podcast, we would love to hear from you and get your opinion on what's discussed in the show. In order to contact us, you can email the Environment Edge Podcast at chagas.ie. Please feel free to ask any questions or even make suggestions on topics you might feel you'd like to hear discussed on the show. In a recent EPA report, it was suggested that Ireland needs a major change in their land use in order to reach our 2050 net zero climate targets, with a suggestion of a 30% reduction in the national herd hitting the headlines. How does Chagas plan to meet this challenge head on, lead and support farmers to meet climate targets? Professor Frank O'Mara, Director of Chagas, joins us to discuss the Chagas Climate Action Strategy. Hi, Frank. Um, you're very welcome to the show. Delighted to be here. Frank, can you tell us a little bit about your background? You've had a very varied and interesting career thus far. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your role and maybe something about your previous work in methane emissions? You also work with the Global Research Alliance and the Intergovernmental um, Panel on Climate and Change. So you're a very busy man at the moment. Well, sure. Look, some of those, I, I suppose some of those are in the past now at this stage. But look, I've been director of Chagas for almost a year and a half now. And I've, I've, wor- I've worked in Chagas since 2006. And most of that time was as director of research until I was lucky enough to be made director in 2021. So before that, um, I worked in UCD where I was a lecturer in animal nutrition and livestock systems. And you know, I did quite a bit of research while I was there as well on on th- those topics of nutrition and livestock production systems. But in my last couple of years there, I was interested in the relationship between livestock and methane emissions in particular. I could see that that was a, a question, you know, that nutritionists could maybe contribute to. So I got involved in that area of research and um, some of that, for instance, uh, the system that we use to de- to generate the emissions from livestock, the methane emissions, you know, my me and my or I and my team developed that as part of a, a project back in in the early 2005 2006, and it's still more or less used today to do the 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 calculating of of livestock emissions. Obviously, it's been improved over time, but the same framework is there. And as I suppose as part of that work, then I was um, lucky enough to get involved in international collaborations, particularly with New Zealand. And they were starting up this global research alliance, which was countries that were interested in livestock uh, and uh, emissions and livestock and climate change. So I, I got a little bit involved in that. And um, I was also lucky to be selected to be what's called a lead author on the um, the IPCC's fourth assessment report. Now, lead author, I was one of hundreds, you know, not, it doesn't, I wasn't the only one. So there were hundreds of lead authors, but the IPCC produces these big assessment reports about every six years. And there's three volumes of them. And I was involved in the fourth assessment report that was published about 2006. And, you know, we've, we've had two since. So that the sixth assessment report was, was published in late 2021 and 2022. And the last bit of it is actually coming out this year, which is the technical summary for policymakers. And they're very big and important reports and they're relied on a lot by policymakers. So it was a great experience to be involved in, in, in one of those. So, you know, since I joined Chagas, I suppose my active involvement in day to day research is, is an awful lot less. I was more involved in research management, but I've, I've always tried to keep involved in, in the area and, um, you know, keep up to speed with, with, with what, what's happening. And I suppose given that it's such a big issue, uh, it's important, I think, to, 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 to do that. Frank, if I was a farmer at home, listen to what you're saying now, you're the director of Chagas, you're, you're leading the organisation. Chagas have a vital role in how farmers farm and how the industry goes forward. You have a very solid background in, in the challenges that we're meeting in climate change. <clears throat> that must give a lot of people around us confidence in, in you to lead us through these problems. Well, look, sure, I hope it's a bit of a help anyway. Um, look, it is the issue, I think, that, that the biggest probably issue that's facing 
agriculture over the, the coming years. Obviously, there's lots of other issues facing us. You know, incomes are always a big issue. There's water quality, there's animal welfare and, and calf transport and things like that. But climate change is an issue that's going to be around for a long time. And I think the, the challenge for, for, for the agriculture sector and farmers and for us as a support agency is to ensure that we can continue to farm and produce food while meeting our obligations around climate change or water quality or whatever. So, look, um, since I became director, we really have identified this as the, the number one priority for us to, to, to help, I suppose, what we can do in, in the whole research and advisory and education area to, to help tackle th this issue. We, we're not going to you know solve it on our own. It's, it's farmers are going to actually have to, to do the things. But I suppose it's our job to make sure that the, the things are there for farmers to do uh, and that they can do things in a way that will still allow them to farm and um and to help them then to to adopt those technologies or, or to do those things that will make a difference on on their individual farms you you know nowadays that uh, i suppose climate change has become a real headline every headline every newspaper it's farmers journal even for example every week there's something in it. but you know one of the headlines that i'm reading lately is by the end of the century scientists are predicting we could potentially be you know two degrees of an increase which is massive and will make massive changes globally to the world and temperature and all the other things that comes with it but i suppose they're warning that if we don't make massive changes very very quickly that there's going to be major problems by the end of the century and that's not that far away really um what i suppose are the main challenges that we that, that we face as an industry going forward to, to to adapt to adapt to what's happening yeah so look the you know the two degrees it could even come quicker than the end of the century um according to some of the the scenarios that are you know quite that are not that far far out um so and look the, the consequences of that you know for for the climate and is, is going to be pretty big but also the consequences for on the geopolitical side you know if if, if parts of the world become um more susceptible to drought and 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 you know people want to leave those areas for economic reasons you you can have increases in migration and we see all the pressures that puts on on, on every country, um, even ones like ourselves that mightn't be too impacted uh, by by the changes in, in weather and climate. So so this is not something look that we we can ignore. And, and I think every country has to try and do its bit uh, to to um, to ensure that we don't uh, reach that that two degree um, change level. And I suppose, look, that, that is one of the challenges like it, it, it is going to take a huge transition. Um, and the big challenge here is to you know wean ourselves off fossil fuels. We use an awful lot of fossil fuels for energy, um, for, for transport, like for electricity generation, heating our houses and offices and for, for industry. And basically over the next you know, 20 years or so, we have to eliminate those fossil fuels um, or virtually el eliminate them. And, and that's a huge transition. And um, not every country has the, the resources to, to pay for that transition. Um, it's going to cost us a lot of money in Ireland. But not every country ha can afford that. So that's one of the challenges. And maybe not every country has the same level of motivation uh, that we might have um, uh, in this part of the world to try to do that. So, so, so that's a big challenge. And I suppose agriculture has a role to play in that as well, because it is responsible for a, a fairly significant share of the world's emissions. And we know that here in Ireland, it's over a third of our emissions come from agriculture. So look, the 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 the. Ask of agriculture is a little bit different. You know, we, we know that we can't eliminate emissions from agriculture. We're still going to need to use fertilizer uh, to, to grow crops and, and grass. We're still going to need to have animals if we're going to have a, a stable food system in, in the world. So so we are going to have still have emissions from agriculture. So the ask is to minimize those emissions as much as we can. And whatever is remaining to try to offset that by carbon sequestration into our soils or into, you know, hedges and woods and forests and so on. So so that's that's, I suppose, what the, the role that Ireland and Irish agriculture has to try to play in this big global challenge that we're facing. I suppose, Frank, as well, like the war in the Ukraine and the political unrest um, all over the world has forced us to better utilise the technologies that Chagas have been researching over the last decade or two decades with clover and protected urea and less technologies. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that will all feed into and bolster the, um, 
you know, the climate um, change in initiative as well. It will, of course, yeah. And and look, um, they say every cloud has a silver lining. So I suppose the the, the rise in fertilizer prices and the availability of it that we, we had, the problems we had last year, uh, did cause farmers to, to think uh, about the amount of fertilizer they were using. And we saw, I think, about a 14% drop in nitrogen fertilizer use last year. And um, and we didn't see much of a drop in in grass production. So I think farmers they they made better use of the slurries they're producing on their own farms and or animal manures. They use the the bag fertilizer a little bit more judiciously. And um and and obviously clover is not an overnight uh, solution, but there's huge interest now in putting in clover. And I suppose trying to sustain and even go further with that reduction in nitrogen use that we we saw last year. And look, there are things that save farmers money uh, as well. So a lot of the time, the solutions to these problems are actually what we call win wins. You know, there's a there's a financial benefit as well as an environmental benefit. And and look, that's. What we're going to be pushing very much is try to make best use of the manures you have on your, your farm, your own resources, and try and uh, buy in your fertilizer through clover rather than on the back of a lorry, uh, because you still will will need some. And, um, and, and, and do the best you can with regard to those things that, that you can control inside your own farm. I suppose ASAP advisors like myself and Carl as well, like we're looking at pollution impact potential maps and working with advisors locally to look at different soil types and how how fertilizers and clovers can be, you know, used better. And um, I suppose that all feeds into it as well. Wouldn't you agree, Carl? Yeah, look, it's it's important, I suppose, from our point of view, and Frank, you've touched on it as well, that you know it's it's not about us just preaching how to fix the thing. It's, I suppose supporting farmers to understand why we're we're asking them to do these things, and I think that's 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 what breaks down resistance to change, Frank. And you're probably seeing that from the top as well. How do you break that down that resistance? Like we were talking about protected urea ten years ago in Johnson Castle, but it's only really come to the table strong in the last two to three years. Yeah, yeah. I think look, I think it's you, you can't just preach at people. You have to explain the why rather than than the what and the how. You know you you really have to convince people of of why you, they need to make a, a particular change and i think we are seeing more engagement from from farmers and more interest from farmers like we had a, a, a as you know we had an open day in Johnstown castle last uh, at the end of august just focused on on these environmental technologies and there was huge interest a huge turnout and um the farmers you know they were hugely engaged and questioning they wanted to know uh, about these things so so look i, I definitely think there's a, a growing awareness um uh, among farmers about about these issues and i think there's a huge willingness of farmers to take on board technologies and and practice changes that make sense um but like anybody you know you want to understand why you have to do something or why you're being asked to do something and it has to make sense uh for you and, and your job or your business and using our signpost farms and our demonstration farms to sort of get that information out as well is, is very very useful um, Frank, in response to meeting government 2030 um, targets on reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 25%, um, Chagas have launched its own climate action strategy, and this is going to run from 2022 to 2030. Could you tell us a little bit about what's in it? I will, yeah. yeah. So look, um, as I said earlier, when I became director, I said, look, this is the biggest priority that we're going to have to deal with over the, the coming years. And you know, the government at the time had increased the targets for, for agriculture and, and indeed for all the sectors, energy and transport and the whole lot. So everybody kind of was getting a higher target to deal with. And um, so, you know, myself and my, my colleagues and the, the Chagas Authority, you know, we agreed that we needed to step up the resources we were putting into the whole area of, of climate change. So that's what our climate strategy, I suppose, is about. And, and in the end of the day, you know, Chagas won't solve the, the agricultural climate emissions. It's farmers that will solve that. And our climate action strategy is all about supporting farmers uh, to do what might be necessary or, or what, 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 what are the things that, that they can do on their farms. So, so we have two jobs to do, as I see it. The first is we have to develop the technologies that farmers can use on their farms. And then we have to support them in adopting those technologies. So there's three elements to our climate strategy then to allow us to do those two jobs. The first is, you know, we're going to increase our, our research effort and we're going to put more resources into the research and we're going to put all the researchers working in, in this area into a single virtual centre because, you know, we have six research centres around the country and there's staff in all of them that are working on, on this issue. So we want to ensure that there's good coordination and leadership 
among all those people. So, so that's the research side, and we hope to, you know, have a, a pipeline of technologies coming out of that research center over the coming years. In terms of supporting farmers um, to adopt the technologies, then, as you mentioned, uh, Deirdre, we have the signpost program established with the last two years almost now. And we have 100, over 100 demonstration farms around the country, you know, that are, are using best practice. I suppose what we want to do now is move that on and, and bring that down then to an individual farmer level that every farmer, not just those 120 farmers, but every farmer can engage and have his or her own plan for what they can do on their farm in their particular circumstances. So, so we're launching this new advisory program. Uh, that's a, you know, it's a, a free program. We're not, it's, it's a public good program. So we're not charging for it. And uh, a farmer that signs up to this program, he or she will, will work with us to baseline their current emissions. You know, what are the emissions on, on your farm? And then what's the plan to try to tackle those emissions? So the, the tagline we use is, is, is know my number, make my plan. And uh, we hope to, you know, to, to roll this out at scale across the, the next couple of years and take in of the order of 10,000 farmers a year into it. To allow us to do that, we have additional advisors, going to be putting hopefully a lot of additional advisors in the field over the next uh, year or two. But also we're developing a, a digital tool um, to facilitate this. And we're doing this in partnership with ICBF and Borbia. And the, the the purpose of the tool, or we're calling it, it's a long name now at the moment, we'll have to get a shorter one soon, but it's called the Sustainability Digital Platform. And the idea there is that, you know, if we bring a discussion group or whatever of farmers together and, you know, we put in their herd number uh, into this, that it'll more or less bring up their emissions profile on their farm without having to go and ask a lot of questions or collect a lot of information. And it'll also have a, a decision support function. And what we mean by that is we can say, well, what if I reduce my fertilizer by 15 percent? What would that do to my emissions? Or what if I switch to protected urea for, you know, 75 percent of my nitrogen instead of uh, can? What would that do to my emissions? So we use that decision support or what if function to develop the plan for that individual farmer. And then we're committing to supporting the farmer to implement that plan over the next uh, three years. So, so that's the, the three elements of our strategy, the, the virtual research centre, the new advisory programme and this digital platform to enable us to work with farmers and, and put numbers on, on what they're doing. So the digital platform, it can track progress, which is very, very useful, but it's also secure as well so the nobody has access to it only the farmer unless he wants that information to go somewhere absolutely look we, we're, we're it'll be the farmer's information we'll obviously he'll need to share it with us if we're to to develop the plan uh with him and i suppose we also are we're working with borbia on on this and you know we would hope that this would uh take a lot of the the, the grunt work out of doing the, the environmental assessment in the borbia audit again if the farmer shares it with with uh the borbia auditor but the farmer controls the data and controls who gets access to it you know uh, frank that's great for farmers because they'll get their score and if they carry out an action they can see that they've made a positive impact on our, our emissions, national emissions. And for, for I suppose, for once, and it's hard at times that farmers get a hard time, but they'll actually get some credit, I suppose, for, for being able to contribute in that way. Absolutely. Look, and it's it's one thing, you know, looking and listening to farmers over the last year talking about this, this, this issue, and, and, and many of them do. And one of the things that they often say is that, look, I don't know, I don't know really what, what I'm supposed to do or, you know, what's expected of me and look, tell me what to do and I'll try and do it sort of, a, a, you know, is the narrative that you sometimes hear. So I suppose we're we're empowering them, them now to, to know, well, this is actually what my farm is is uh, is contributing and what I, by my actions, are am able to do to contribute to to reaching this 25 percent target. So it's a tool, I think, to empower people. And, and that's really important. I suppose the other thing is the advisor is going to hand, you know, hold their hand through the process because some people are nervous of technologies to start off with. So it'll be one to one advisory um, support. Yeah, yeah and look, exactly. we, we, we probably see it working in group settings a fair bit, Deirdre, you know, because yeah. we know discussion groups work well and, and people, you know, they can see what, what their colleagues, their neighbours or friends or whatever, how their numbers look and what, what kind of actions they're talking about taking. So we think the group dynamic um, will be an important 
part of this as well. So that's probably how we'll we'll roll it out a lot. But you know what I mean? If we're supporting a farmer, we're putting in clover. But that that certainly will, you know, involve discussion groups or farm walks or, or indeed maybe one to one uh, visits to support a farmer in that journey, which can be fairly complex. Yeah, and the actions will be achievable. They'll be discussed with the they'll be discussed with the farmers. Oh, so they'll be, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, which is which is great. There it's like any act- our rules. Yeah, like the yeah, farmer exactly. will have will will have control over the actions. He or she will say, "Well, this is what I'm going to do." You know, so it won't be the advisor saying you should reduce your fertilizer now by twenty percent. It'll be a farmer with with the advice of the advisor saying, "Yeah, well, maybe I could actually take another twenty percent off my fertilizer if if I put in the clover and." you know, use make better use of the slurry and so on. But the farmer has to be in control of this. Brilliant. I was on a farm actually about three weeks ago. We were talking about this because there's some talk about in the papers and the farmer said to me that they hope Chagas put up a trophy and all Ireland series per county. He said it's the only chance Wexford would have a win in anything. <laughs> so oh, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> so maybe put that on the agenda there, Frank, a trophy yeah, for yeah. who does the best for county. But going back to the research element of it, um and your methane background, there's been a lot of talk about, um, I suppose, methane and potential for different feed add- additives. Is that the type of work that you expect that that research is going to target or will it be across the board? Well, it'll be, cert- look, that certainly will be a big element, of it, but it'll also be in relation to um, to the fertilizer and the whole, uh, I suppose, clover, multi-species swords, the, trying to reduce that, trying to... Um, you know, there's quite a bit of emissions come from actually stored slurry. So we'll be focused on how we might be able to, to put solutions in place around that. Uh, in relation to the animal emissions, yes, the feed additives are, are an area. And look, you know, there are first generation feed additives coming on the market now. They have limitations. I've no doubt that we'll see second and third and fourth generation type products coming on, on, on the market over the coming years. But also, you know, the old um, efficiency things are going to be really important. So, you know, we know that um, if we can get animals to their slaughter weights at a younger age, like, you know, it might not be great for the animal. You know, the life might be a couple of months shorter. But, you know, from the point of view of, of emissions, it's a big saving in emissions because these big animals, as they reach the end of their life, they're they're producing quite a bit of, of meat. in. so focusing in on all the efficiency factors that start with the breeding of, of calves, you know, the, the bull selection right through calf rearing, grassland management, winter feeding and health plans and so on. That's the, the, they're the kind of bread and butter things that lead to improvements in, in those efficiency parameters. It's the same with dairy cows. You know, the EBI is still a very, very important tool uh, for dairy cow efficiency. And, you know, we've some research around the, the specific impact of the EBI on emissions that, that we'd hope to see coming to fruition in the next couple of years. So so there's a lot of irons in the fire in relation to the, the research. And we hope that, you know, they, they all won't work. You know, that's the nature of research. But we hope that there'll be a lot of um, exciting and very positive things coming out of that pipeline over the, the coming years. I, I think it's going to be a super support as well to the politicians and regulators to help support farmers, I suppose, into the future and in what, what I suppose, what areas look at. But just come back to the advisors that are coming on board, that's going to be massive for farmers to have that support system because they're going to target exactly gaseous emissions. Um, but I suppose in, in as part of that and the sustainability planner as well, we're going to be counting um emissions or carbon credits whatever you want to call it and we had um i had a td on the on the show here maybe last year talking about carbon credits and the potential for it to come into ireland similar to france in the future and we're not there and we're a good bit off it yet but is there potential i suppose for maybe farmers to be re- rewarded in that way that carbon credit kind of way in the future Look, the, the, there is, um, I suppose, the first thing we have to do is have a fairly robust and reliable system of, of counting the sequestration, as we call it, um, onto farms. And, and that's very much part of our plans for the sustainability digital platform, that tool I mentioned. You know, we hope we won't we won't have a day one, but we would hope that we can um, also include the sequestration that's going on on farms, not just the emissions. So farmers are getting a kind of a balance sheet type report. But, you know, we, we still have a lot of uncertainty about the sequestration rates in our soils. And uh, indeed, some of our soils emit carbon or, or drained peat uh, grassland soils emit quite a bit of carbon. So we have a lot of research going on to better ref- refine or give us more accurate estimates of that sequestration. That's going to take a couple of years. Um, when it does, you know, I think we'll be in a much stronger position to to reliably quantify what might be the, the sequestration on farms. And 
and and then I suppose whether it's voluntary schemes like maybe some of the the, the food companies um wanting to incentivize farmers through some sort of a a, a sequestration type bonus um or whether it's state led schemes uh, and the EU Commission is is you know very active in this area of kind of putting together the framework for how countries might run carbon farming schemes. Um, I think we will see those emerging. Um, but, you know, with any of them, the, the importance of having a robust and reliable and verifiable system for, for calculating the, the credits is going to be very, very important. Well, what's going to happen, Frank, if everything goes south on us and we miss our 2030 targets? Yeah, so look... Um, I suppose I'm I'm a real maybe I'm an optimist. So I'm a real focus on Plan A and and don't be getting your Plan B um in place. But look, the 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 system is that um the government have put in place a a, a climate action plan and there's implementation targets and implementation plans in that and they are going to be monitoring those very very carefully led by the Department of the Taoiseach. So every minister, whether it's the Minister for Agriculture or Minister for Transport or Minister for Energy, you know they will be accountable to the doll for the performance of the sector under their control. So if it looks like a sector is not on track to meet its target, well, you know, the pressure will be on to to take additional actions or remedial actions. So look, I think, uh, you know, it's important for us now to get on with the job. We're, we're only kind of one year into, it was only last July, actually not even a year yet, that the final sectoral targets were set and, you know, agriculture was assigned this 25% target. So the job now is to get on with seeing how how fast we can make progress um to reach in that target and uh look you know if we don't reach it certainly look i'm i'm sure there will be a lot of political uh, discussion and debate and consequences about that in the end of the day if 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 countries aren't meeting their their emissions reductions targets the problem is the world will continue to war them and all the consequences of that for our global food system and for the as i mentioned earlier the geopolitical system you know it's not a good outlook so I think the the challenge is for us all to to get on and do what we we can. Um, it's a big challenge, but you know what I mean. You, if you don't make a start, you'll never get there. A friend of mine has just gone to Venice on her holidays this week, right? And she, she's not going to have any gondola trip. There's no water. I see that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Exactly. I suppose that's just an indicator, isn't it? Yes, and we've had probably the driest February on on record. We we're in the last day day of February. Um, but we've had virtually no rain here in Carlo for for February, something like ten or or, or twelve mils. Yeah, yeah. Incredible and it's January, yeah. really dry as well. It's great this time of year, but it wouldn't, you know, it would be a bit early to be starting a drought. Exactly. It's brutal when you think about it. the drought last year. Then monsoon weather nearly had to build an arc there in the back end of the year, and now a little drought again. It's it's yeah yeah. You know, it's all of a sudden we're getting these things made, but look, we have to cope with that as they come, and, and we have to support farmers to to deal with yeah. those challenges. And, and look, you know, we we you need to you don't need to get too panicked. Like we we've always had variation in our weather. Actually, I, I follow the weather here in Oak Park fairly closely, and the statistics for rainfall in September you would have said it was going to be the driest year on record, uh, at least in the last uh, good number of years. But it ended up nearly exactly on average for rainfall. Just the distribution pattern was a little bit strange last year. But I'm sure we went back, you know, into other years you'd find similar, you know, changes. So. And, you know, we, we shouldn't start to think that every couple of dry weeks is, oh, Jeannie Mac, the you know, is ending or whatever. But um, certainly, look, there are very strange weather patterns, I suppose, emerging all, all right from time to time. Yeah, I well, don't want to finish on a negative, Frank, but look, there was, I suppose, a recent EPA report that came out there that suggested potentially, or if we're trying to meet our 2050 uh, zero or net zero climate targets, that we could have to possibly be a 30% reduction of the national herd and that that has worried and concerned a lot of farmers because um you know no one wants to cut the herd but do, do you have any i suppose words of support farmers or something you could say or how are we going to combat this yeah so look um that particular study uh to the best of my knowledge it, it looked at a number of scenarios that would would ha- you know would get us to what's called climate neutrality by 2050 now, you know, it had to make an awful lot of assumptions about how we might get there. And um, so assumptions about things like the emissions from land that I mentioned earlier from our drained peats or um, assumptions about um, the levels of afforestation. And I would say 
we have a lot of research to do uh, before we have enough certainty about modeling those type of scenarios. So we have a lot of research going on now on, on the emissions from those drain peats. And, um, you know, until the research is completed, you can't be sure what it's going to say. But, you know, the, there's a, a plausible um, scenario that it could be a lot less than, than than what was assumed in that study. Um, some of the early research would, would indicate that. There, there's also the, the other thing that the study um, didn't and probably couldn't take into account is, but what technologies will emerge over the, the coming years? And I talked earlier about a lot of the research we have going. So I, I'd be very confident, you know, that, that there will additional solutions come out of research, additional ways to, to reduce emissions. And when we factor those in and when, when we get more accuracy around the emissions our sequestration on our land, it could be a very, very different picture. So, so look, studies like that, you know, it's important that they're done so that we can kind of see the the parameters that we might be facing. But in many ways, it's there's there's a lot of un, uncertainty uh, there, and and um, until we have more certainty on some of those things, it's it's very, you know, I I wouldn't start planning on the basis of of those type of scenarios yet. It's it's it, that's that's the I suppose you're after hitting the nail in the head. Or uncertainty leads a little bit to fear and stress amongst the farm community. But I think over the last half an hour that we've had a chat that you've you've mentioned dozens of things that that are actually in action now that are going to actually contribute to, to combating I suppose the climate challenge that we have in agriculture. And certainly, I feel more at ease. And in particular, the strategy the strategy that that you've mentioned, you're talking about increased research. You're talking about actual advisors out on the ground to help and new tools, new digital tools to support those advisors to help farmers reduce their emissions or know their number and combat that. So I think Chagas are certainly putting their shoulders to the wheel more so than ever before. They've really tackled climate change hard. And I think with your background, Frank, and leadership, um, I think we have a good, good chance to solve this. And I know I asked you a negative question at the end, but I certainly think people hopefully listen to podcasts will have a bit more hope, I suppose, going forward. Yeah, look, I think people should. It, it is a big challenge, but, you know, the resources that are being brought to bear in this, not just in Chagas, but, you know, across other uh, agencies and organisations and, you know, the co-ops and the, the meat processes are all very keen to support whatever way they can, the, the changes that we need. So, you know, if you do nothing, it certainly will be a big challenge. But the amount of work that's going on in this area, you know, it would be amazing if we didn't uh, make good inroads uh, into to cracking this problem. Yeah, great way to finish, Frank. I think that's that's the trick to now. Once once we're on the farm at home, just let's get going at it. The, the advice is out there and we just need to tackle it straight away. Um, just like to thank you, Frank. Uh, thanks a million for coming on, on board today because I know you're a very busy man and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. That's it for this episode of the Chagas Environment Edge podcast. Thanks to Professor Frank Pomara, Director of Chagas, for joining us on the show. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe to the podcast. You can listen to Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Carl Summers. And I'm Deirdre Glenn. Join us next time for the Chagas Environment Edge podcast, signpost to farm sustainability. <laughs>